Hello there. Can you folks hear me at the back? If you can, OK, lots of nods. That's very good to hear. OK, uh, what to do when software is heating the world? If you do not know, this is a pun on the phrase, what to do when software is eating the world. And it's, due, it's a credit to a guy called Kenneth Bowles, who's written a fantastic book called Future Ethics. Hello, my name is Chris Adams. I am currently a prototype fund fellow. And my job is basically to work out how to use open source and open data to help transition the internet away from fossil fuels, because that feels like a kind of worthwhile thing to spend some of my time on. Um, just to give some background about what I do and who I am. Uh, so previously, I've basically worked at a string of kind of wacky environmental uh, startups. So Loco2 is all, has been all about making trains as easy to book as planes. And it's a kind of multi-layered pun, like low carbon, but also locomotion. AMI is, uh, stands for Avoid Mass Extinction Engine. We basically we burned through something like 10 million US dollars of VC funding, hiring a load of scientists to read all these IPCC reports, uh, take the, all the information, put them into models, and JavaScript specifically, and then put an API on that. Uh, the Green Web Foundation is what I'm doing right now, which is making, about making the web green. And I also organize an online, online community called climateaction.tech. And as you can tell from the name, it's for people in tech, and it's about climate action. All right, so I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes of your time basically sharing three things with you. First of all, why you might care about climate change. Uh, the next thing I'll, talk, I'll share is a mental model for how to kind of relate this to what you do as professionals. And then I'll give you some, hopefully, some concrete things you can do next to kind of help just address this kind of awful background level of existential dread that we all seem to have when we think about climate change. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? Anyone? OK, nods. Yeah, it's scary, isn't it? That's OK. It's OK for it to be scary if we do something about it. So uh, let's talk about why you might care. And I'll give you a bit of background on kind of climate, I suppose. So first of all, um, who remembers the water cycle from school? Show of hands. OK, yes, that's exactly what I was hoping we would find. OK, so you know we've got that. Oh, it works. OK, so like sun might kind of heat up water. Water comes up into here can be blown around by the wind, then it will come back down again. If it's cold enough, we'll end up with things as, say, snow or in ice caps. And generally, what we might find is that if we kind of heat up the kind of system that we're in, we might find more of that tends to be, t t t stops being ice and might be, say, kind of like flood water and stuff like that. And uh, if that water ends up in places we don't expect it to be, like cities, it's bad news. And uh, I share this here because I think a, developers, uh, as developers, we like to think about systems. But it also, I think it's useful to realize that there are other kinds of systems as well, or cycles. So this one here is the carbon cycle. So there's a cycle for carbon as well, albeit it's much, much, much slower. So this green stuff down here, this is us, right? You and me, we're all made of carbon, all right? And like when we breathe, we kind of breathe out CO2, which ends up in, say, the atmosphere, as we have up here. And sometimes plants will basically take CO2 and turn it into trees, which is cool. Thanks, trees, right? And then down here, we'll actually, we've got like other things in there. We've got carbon in the ocean, so like fish and seaweed and stuff, but also some gas is actually absorbed by the ocean itself as well. And when things like, say, seaweed or fish die, they kind of go down into the depths, as we can see here. And uh, that's much, much, much larger. And as you, and over time, when things sink to the bottom, you'll end up with some of this eventually kind of forming sediment and turning into rock. And that's kind of the kind of cycle that we have. And that's how it's been for the last, like, say, tens of thousands of years. Now, this started to change a bit in around 1850, when we started to use a lot more energy as we kind of developed. And uh, we started using more energy. And to meet that demand, we started burning fossil fuels in earnest and burning wood. And as you can see with these two arrows, this is basically what we're, sh we're seeing here. All these red dots down here are basically fossil fuels. You can think of them as part of the kind of Earth's crust here. And uh, this has been useful. Like, because of burning fossil fuels, we now have Wi-Fi and iPhones and conferences and closure. And that's kind of useful in many ways. But the thing is that when it's up in the sky, there are also issues with that. So let's fast forward to uh, 2017, which is where this was. Now, this, is actually, this video is on YouTube. It's really, really cool. It's also quite confusing. So I'm just showing you the highlights from this. But if you want the full version, by all means, check out the link on the screen here. So, what we've basically done over the last 200 years is take all this uh, carbon that's down here, and we've basically put it into the rest of the system. And this has meant that we've got way more carbon up in the sky now. And 
if you, you that's basically what's the best way to say this? I think I'm just going to like refer to uh, a way that we talk about climate change with kids to help explain why that's a bad why why that's a bad thing for us. So what you're looking at here, and I'm not sure if you can just about see it, but you should be able to see a globe, right? And this is a this is actually from a thread by a lady called Professor uh, Julia K. Steinberger. She's a really really good person to follow on Twitter because she's like she basically shares a lot of information about climate science in a really kind of accessible fashion. She basically did this thread talking about how she. She talks about climate science with her kids. And uh, what she basically did was she basically took a globe, wrapped it in a kind of blanket like this, and the concept of using blankets to warm things up, that was kind of enough for kids to understand. And this is pretty much what we're doing. And if, basically, kids can understand this. In fact, it turns out that kids are pretty good at uh, uh, thinking about climate, and we have a bit of a blind spot around climate, uh, climate instead. Anyone know who this person is here? Okay, a few people. This is Greta Thunberg. She basically started campaigning about climate about um, last year when she basically went on strike from school to talk about basically uh, the fact that we're not doing enough. All right, and uh, what she started doing was uh, she's basically kicked off a movement about climate uh, called Fridays for the Future. And if you go along to these uh, these events, which I'd recommend you do, you'll fee you'll see these arguments put forward by kids, which basically say. We're striking from school now because there's no point studying for a, for a future if you're not doing anything to save that future. Or why should I get an education if you won't listen to people who already do have an education? And to be fair, they have a point. This lady here, it's Fahina Yamin. She's like a climate negotiator, lawyer, person who knows what she's talking about. She's been advising countries for the last 20 years. And she's now known for gluing herself to corporate headquarters in an act of desperation to get us to pay attention, to do something, because things are really, 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 really bad. Now, I'm, when I say like we should be paying attention, we should be paying attention because things are literally on fire. So like in the UK, uh, the, it, it, by April 20, 2019, we'd had the same amount of wildfires as we had the entire, all of last year. And uh, we've had a nice heat wave, which is nice, but it's also had some other effects. So this heat wave is, what you're looking at here is, this heat wave affecting Greenland. Now, the orange bits are basically Greenland, a large country, or uh, melting. And this is creating like measurable changes in sea level in the space of like a few days. This is not normal. This is really not good, all right? But it's worse than that. We're actually seeing uh, fire, wildfires in the Arctic now. And uh, what you're seeing here is these aren't just trees burning. These are actually, this is, this is basically like peat, the kind of stuff, this is kind of like the carbon wrapped in, say, uh, the ground. And it doesn't burn for a day, it burns for months. And it re releases huge amounts of carbon, like the kind of the same amount as a Belgium in, this, in an entire year. Like, this is really, 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 really scary stuff. And I talk about this heat because it's having an effect on what our world's going to be like in future, right? It's going to be really, really hard to live on this future and if we do nothing. And I kind of feel like as professionals, if there's harm, uh, which is avoidable, and this stuff is by actually changing how we work and what we do, then part of our job as professionals is to take steps to avoid this. So I hope the idea is that we, we need to kind of reduce the amount of carbon that we're emitting, all right? And as tech, like the industry, we're responsible for around 2 and 4% of global emissions. So that's like all of shipping or all of aviation or Canada, all right? So this is a non-trivial amount, right? But if we wanted to like reduce it, we'd not want to work out how to actually measure this. So this is how you this is how people tend to talk about carbon emissions and how they how they measure them. There's like three kind of scopes that you might think about. And if someone talks about reducing emissions and they're not talking about this, suggest they're not really taking it all that seriously. All right? Scope one uh, is basically emissions from me burning stuff myself, all right? So I'm using like beverages here because most of us tend to like coffee or tea. And uh, scope two might be emissions from electricity that's gener burned on your behalf, uh, generated, so that's people burning fossil fuels on your behalf. Then scope three is stuff in your entire supply chain. And I share the stuff about the supply chain because it's important for people like us, because increasingly we use cloud or we like, uh, rather than running things ourselves, and if you want to know what this looks like, this is an example of a company that's kind of doing some things right. So Stripe, okay, who's heard of Stripe? Okay, most of you should have heard of Stripe, good, all right? They are reporting about this, and, and you can see, right? So they tend not to run that many servers or burn that much fuel themselves. They run some kind of electricity, but not that much. But the biggest thing they have is basically from their supply chain, and that's usually servers, employees, commuting, and business travel, right? So we need to be doing something like that. And here's where I'm going to share a mental model to help you think about this kind of stuff. 
I call it platform packets and process. And this is something I came up, well, actually I got a load of help from, from Yulia uh, two years ago when I was doing a talk like this in Florence. So platform is infrastructure you run, all right? Packets is infrastructure other folk run, like the rest of the internet. Process is decisions you make about how your organization works that kind of bake in emissions. So let's talk about platform and what levers you might have to kind of affect the emissions you have. So there is two things uh, to bear in mind. So provisioning is basically matching capacity to use. And uh, if you, this, this graph here is basically to show you a kind of idea of like demand because, or, or usage of, uh, of any kind of service, right? This one actually is uh, showing how people use the internet in Australia, right? So people tend not to use internet so much when they're asleep, all right? So that's what you see here. Then people wake up and they start basically using the internet more because they go to work and they use things online. Then they use it more and more and more. Then they all go home, watch Netflix, and fall asleep. And like that's basically the process. We have like a cycle. And if you build a, run a digital service, the chances are you're going to have something like that yourself. And usually, if it's your job to make sure there are servers available to kind of satisfy requests for that, you will basically kind of provision a server. So you'll look at like the the peak, and then you'll basically put a big physical server to look after that. And like this is kind of okay because provisioning traditionally has been a pain, and uh, we, we we'd accept that we need to leave like a box idling most of the time. Problem is. Uh, if we're able to make a conceptual leap that the cloud is someone else's computer, then it shouldn't be that much of a leap to realize that computers run on electricity, and that we generally burn fossil fuels to generate electricity. So in addition to burning money when we have a big server like this, we're also burning fossil fuels, and I've just explained why that's not a good thing. Thankfully, there has been a trend to abstracting machines away to make them easier to manage and kind of match demand curves that we have. So these used to be like VMs or containers or dynos. Uh, but generally, all these things have the kind of same purpose to basically allow you to match the demand, as you can see here, to basically match, demand, to, to, to match usage more. So this is an improvement. But we're still like, not matching it perfectly, and we're still burning money and fossil fuels. And like we said before, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. So there are some really interesting things now. Show of hands who's been playing with serverless, or stuff like that. OK, some of us. So this is the kind of brand new hotness, and it's interesting in that it's putting the incentives in the right place for the first time. So things automatically scale up and down to your use. So we now have the incentives uh, that we can see uh, by just like updating how our code works. But there's a, uh, there's a, there's a trade-off when we abstract like this. We basically go from having lots and lots of people who will just give us a big VM or a big, big server to fewer and fewer providers of this. And to the point we basically either run things with either Microsoft, Google, or Amazon, or some comp companies that work on top of those ones here. So this is kind of like the solution. That we, this, this is where we are right now if we care about this. You get to pick two, about, two of these. And this is like not a good solution, not a good state for us to be in. And we really could do well to not be in this situation in future. So that's one thing, and uh, provider is the other way. So I spoke before about how you can basically re reduce emissions just by switching regions. And this is one of the reasons why. So this is a map of which regions are sustainable and which regions are not sustainable. And for reasons best known to a trillion dollar company, they've decided that, yeah, we're just going to have a few s sustainable regions rather than all of them being sustainable. And we, as professionals, seem to be OK with that. And the reason this is possible is because the carbon uh, emitted from running the data uh, servers in different places is usually tied to where what kind of power is actually generated, uh, it, how you generate that power. So if you look here, so France, full of nukes, like loads of nuclear power, pretty green. Germany is the land of coal and solar, so it's kind of orangey, right? Up here, Scandinavia, loads and loads of mountains, so you've got loads of hydro. Poland, not so good. They really, really like coal there, which means that any kind of servers are running on really dirty power unless said otherwise, all right? So this means that we can end up with things like this, and this is actually a cool map that was put together by Mastodon C. They were some of the original like OG green data people and a bunch of lovely Clojurians. And uh, what they basically, they put together this map to kind of give you an idea of emissions per hour of, of compute that you might purchase. And because on the west coast of America, you've got loads of hydro and things like that, it's going to be greener than on the east coast, which is full of Virginia and coal country. So this is, what, this is how where you run things can actually have an impact. And this is what some of the stuff I do. I work at the Green Web Foundation. We're building a directory. So if you cared about climate and you wanted to 
not run things on fossil fuels, then you have some options. And I'm more than happy to talk about this later on. So I've spoken about platform and packets. This is infrastructure you do not control. Where, and this is basically the rest of the internet. Like It's good that one, one organization can't control the entire internet. But in this case here, because you can't control the power used to run the rest of the internet, all you can do is control how much you send over the wire. All right? And we've got a problem here in that web pages in general are getting bigger uh, over time. So you can see here showing basically the average, uh, sorry, the mean size of the average web page, starting small to the point that we're now larger than the original release of Doom uh, web work that. So we've got pages which are growing in size. We also use pages more, use like the internet more because it's convenient and we have phones and tethers and things like that. And also because cellular networks use much more energy to shift the same amount of data as wired or, wi or as like Wi-Fi, we've got problems here. So we're sending bigger files more often using ever more inefficient ways to send them. Like this is not good news for carbon emissions, all right? The good news is, though, people are starting to wake up to this. Like in the design world, people are starting to realize that if it takes electricity to send data, then and if, ele if generating electricity emits carbon, then performance budgets are basically the same as carbon budgets. All right. So, who, who here has heard of Lighthouse here? Okay, Lighthouse is basically a tool that you can use to audit your pages to see how kind of gri how how fast they are or how accessible they are and things like that. So one thing that we've been doing at the Green Web Foundation is build a thing called Greenhouse, which is basically a plugin for Lighthouse. Now, it lets you basically see uh, how much of your supply chain is running on fossil fuels versus not running on fossil fuels. Um, I'm a bit behind on time, so I'm going to skip over this thing here. The thing I was just going to say is that, OK, it's not just like web pages that we need to act upon. And, uh, Actually, I'll talk about it now, actually. So uh, if you look, uh, this, is the, this is a chart from uh, the Shift project. They basically looked at the, where the emissions were and where the carbon footprint was with the internet. And most of it is on internet, is from, from video rather than like us changing pages. And a colossal amount of it is porn. Uh, so basically, porn is responsible for a, quart, a sixth of the carbon footprint of the entire internet, which is pretty eye-opening in so many ways. All right. Uh, but this is some other things to think about. When you are thinking about, say, sending stuff over the wire, one of the other big levers you have is basically designing things so that you don't need to upgrade to the latest and greatest device every single time. So this is, a, this is, this, this is basically an infographic from Apple, Apple's most recent sustainability report, where they basically say, uh, this is where our emissions are. And you can see this thing going all the way around here is all the emissions associated with building iPhones. So if we have like a two-year upgrade cycle rather than a four-year upgrade cycle, that's like the biggest thing we get. That's like, we're, we're, that, that's like a massive influent, influence on the, the total emissions that we might actually have. And you compare that to the actual kind of usage, it's not that big, really. And this is kind of standard for most uh, electronics. And that's kind of, we need to kind of think about how we'd like design electronics to either allow us to kind of modularly change things or do something about the fact that most of the emissions are from kind of creating stuff. So I spoke a bit about like platform and packets. Now I'll talk a bit about process. Let's say that you're going to be a really good company and you're going to run everything on green power and you're going to design all your all your device, all your kind of digital services to work on the the most the the, the the smallest and we and least powerful devices, as well as like the shiny new iPhone that got released last week. All right, um, Whole Grain Digital is an interesting company because they're doing some stuff like this. They run all their infrastructure on renewable power, and uh, they do not fly to only conferences. And uh, they basically wrote a blog post about this is what we looked at when we tried to work out our carbon footprint. And they're not a big company; they're like 17 people. All right, and even when they're doing lots of the right things. This is where they saw where their emissions were from. They saw that most of it was still from business travel, all right? So that's like catching trains. And among that, like more than 90% is from commuting. So you can basically make an, um, a, a kind of argument that remote is good because it's, it makes it more accessible for lots of other people. Also, it's like a planet-friendly thing to actually do too. So I said I'd kind of share some things which you can do next uh, if you actually, if, the, if you cared about this and you kind of feel like I do that as professionals, if there is a way that we can avoid, we, we, can, we can avoid harm, then we should. And uh, the first thing I'd say is actually just 
get into the habit of talking about it. Because even though it's difficult to talk about right now, it's not, there is no scenario where it becomes easier to talk about if we continue on the path we're on right now. And I found this guide really, really useful. It basically is a nice, gentle way and gives you a nice script to talk about this with either coworkers or people around climate change. Because look, the, the single most important thing we can do is talk about climate change so we can actually act upon it. Um, you can also engage politically. I spoke about kids uh, protesting in the streets to get something done. And uh, every Friday, you basically have a load of scared kids who are basically saying, I'm scared, and I need you to be doing something about this to move away from business as usual. And here's a chance every Friday to basically s talk to the people who you're going to have a really awkward conversation with in five or 10 years otherwise, and basically say, basically say yes, I care about this too, and there's something that I can do. And you don't need to take an entire day. You can do this at like a lunch break. It's designed to allow you to, the, to do that kind of stuff. Um, you can also engage professionally. And uh, we're seeing people who are doing stuff like this. So Hadley Beeman, who is the CTO of NHS Digital in uh, the UK, and Daniel Apokvist, who is the, one of the co-authors of the they're basically people on the technical architecture group. They're basically talking about this stuff. So you have the people who design the web basically say, look, this needs to be sustainable now. And this is the kind of thing that we need to be thinking. This needs to be like a new norm for us as we build, uh, as we build digital services in future. Because like, you, can't, you either respect the science or you don't respect the science. And like, I kind of, if there's one thing that I want you to do, uh, with the time I have is to kind of think about this and take a photo of this slide right now with your friend and then share it with your boss and share it with your co-workers because this is what this is what we need to actually be doing. Thank you, people are actually doing it. Yes. All right, we need to change the norm around this. We need to basically say, of course, the internet runs on renewable power. Why on earth would we run it on fossil fuels in the same way that we wouldn't think about running cars on, with, with lead in their petrol, or we wouldn't expect to build buildings with asbestos in them? This is avoidable harm, and we, could, we can and we should be thinking about this and changing to do things differently. So we kind of need like a cloud moonshot to get off fossil fuels, and this stuff is confusing and it's difficult and uh, this is why I help run a group called climateaction.tech because there's a growing number of us who are trying to figure out how to move away from this ridiculous default where we're basically building the future on fossil fuels when it's utterly avoidable and there are options now we, to we totally can do this um, if you are so that's like most of us here and now it's really hard to be at a conference and not talk about the fact that we've traveled here in various ways. And there are other people who are wrestling with this. And I've seen this, which I think is really interesting. And I think it's worth emulating inside the industry. So Kenneth Bowles, he's basically said, look, I know that as a consultant or as someone who works in tech, this is the, uh, this is the single biggest thing that I'm con I, I can, I can impact I can have. So if, if I'm going to talk somewhere, I need this to at least be offset and I need to be having flying as my last resort. And this is the thing that we can do as speakers. And I think it's a thing that we, we, we can ask of each other as well to do that. So that's kind of it. I've got, I think I've used all my time. Uh, this talk is online, and every single slide I've linked to either a peer-reviewed paper or something similar that, is, that should, should give you something to work with. Also, if you're interested in building a green stack, because we need a green stack now. We need like the internet to be running on renewable power and not fossil fuels if we care about kids and we respect science. Please, please do talk to me. This line here, it, HOC Green Stack, that will take you to a Google form. You can basically sort some time to talk with me. And I'm going to be around all this afternoon and tomorrow as well. And I think that's all my time. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.